wonderful. I think we can get started now, everyone. Uh, let's kick off our event. So a very good afternoon, morning, or evening to everyone joining us today, uh, wherever you might be around the world. Uh, and a very warm welcome to this month's forum talk on technology, the global environmental challenge, and democracy. So my name is Maya Groff. I'm an international lawyer based in The Hague and a convener of the Climate Governance Commission of the Global Challenges Foundation. And I welcome you to this forum talk also on behalf of the Council of Europe's World Forum for Democracy in collaboration with event partners, the Global Governance Forum and Leiden University, Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs. So this forum talk is part of a year long campaign, 12 months, one question. Can democracy save the environment? With August, uh, where we are now, dedicated to technology, the environment, and democracy. A different theme will be addressed each month until November, where there will be a three-day World Forum gathering in Strasbourg, uh, which is the largest democracy-focused gathering of its kind in the world. So just by way of, of background, the World Forum for Democracy is uh, a very unique platform for political decision makers and activists to debate solutions to key challenges for democracies worldwide. And uh, it does so by identifying and analyzing experimental initiatives and practices to try to highlight and encourage democracy innovations at the grassroots and then transferring these innovations to systemic levels, all levels of governance in order to strengthen the foundations of democratic societies. So a very important uh, mandate, particularly in, in our times. So I'm very excited to be here today with our event panelists, who I will introduce in just a moment, uh, in order to support this really vital mandate of the World Forum for Democracy. And I very much hope our discussion today can make a contribution to the ongoing debates. So moving on to our theme for today, the unprecedented global ecological challenges uh, posed by climate change, biodiversity loss, among others, raise a whole range of very compelling questions about the intersection between these challenges, the uses and application of current and also emerging technology, uh, and then also, vitally, the ability of democracies around the world to react and effectively use, uh, effectively to respond to these crises. And today's event is very timely, as of course uh, the uh, IPCC released its sixth assessment report uh, about current conditions of, of climate change this week, informing the international community of the continued very rapid and grave effects human-caused global heating, and underlying that we must act now to drastically cut emissions to avoid the very worst catastrophic outcomes. And so it's urgent that we constructively as possible use all the tools in our toolboxes as societies to address this challenge. So in that regard, with respect to technology, uh, current and emerging technology present exciting new solutions to enable uh, better collective responses, and we'll hear about some of those today. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a currently a transnational problem threatening potentially to undermine the foundations of democracy uh, with technologically enabled misinformation, uh, with really a great potential to disrupt the adequate uh, climate and environmental actions needed, uh, reducing capacities of democracies to res respond to urgent environmental challenges. So to discuss these issues, we're very fortunate to have with us today some leading CEOs, researchers, and policy experts to analyze these important dimensions on the topic. And also very importantly, what we can all do to contribute uh, to ensure that we can rise to the current challenges. Uh, and just a word about forum, uh, the format of today's forum. We'll start with presentations from the invited experts, followed by an interactive discussion and question and answer with participants. Um, and we are very lucky to have some youth discussants who will join us uh, at the end of the presentations, uh, who I will introduce later. But first, let me just very briefly introduce uh, the distinguished panelists that are joining us today. 
Firstly, uh, we have Amy, Amy Eagleston. She is a democracy and dialogue expert at the Social and Economic Council of the Netherlands. And she's currently a special advisor to the chairperson of the Dutch Climate Council on issues of democratization and public participation. She has spent much of her career living and working in developing democracies from South Africa to Liberia to Iraq, focusing on democratic approaches to land and water reform, as well as natural resource governance. Next, we have uh, Herb Lin, and Dr. Lin is a senior research scholar for cyber policy and security at the Center for International Security and Cooperation, and Hank J. Holland Fellow in Cyber Policy and Security, uh, both at Stanford University. His research interests uh, relate to policy-related dimensions of cybersecurity and cyberspace, uh, with a particular interest in the use of offensive operations in cyberspace as instruments of national policy and in security dimensions of information warfare and influence operations on national security. He's been a member of the Science and Security Board uh, of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and still is. And in 19, uh, sorry, in 2016, he served on President Obama's Commission on Enhancing National Cybersecurity. Next, we have Gavin McCormick, who's an executive director of Environment, the environmental nonprofit What Time. And What Time develops and shares automated emissions reduction software techniques with a broad range of actors, governments, companies, uh, providing novel means to instantly improve the carbon uh, footprint in various ways. Gavin also serves as the electricity lead for Climate Trace, a joint initiative of 10 NGOs and companies working together to combine satellite imagery and artificial intelligence to make global uh, greenhouse gas emissions transparent. Uh, next, we have Tomer Schallet, who is the CPO and founder of Climate View, based in Sweden, a technology company working with cities around the world to execute pathways to net zero faster. He has over 20 years of technology experience, previously helping large corporations tackle complex problems, and he has a range of patents. And last but not least, we have uh, Sushant Zaganepur who's a social scientist, entrepreneur, and CEO, founder of Sway, an AI-powered platform for smarter organizational decisions. He's based on the west coast of Canada. And Sway helps companies, cities, and organizations of various sizes uh, harness the collective intelligence of their employees uh, to better uh, resource innovative ideas, program uh, products, uh, he's also uh, working uh, on, in the envir environmental spheres. He's a board advisor of biocarbon engineering, a reforestation startup using drones to replant a billion uh, trees per year. So let's move then first uh, to Herb Lin uh, to give our introductory presentation. And in terms of the contours of today's session, we're going to first talk about some of the technologically enabled problems that we're facing in this sphere. Uh, then we'll move to current efforts by governments uh, for democratic engagement on climate and environmental policy with Amy. And then we'll move to uh, dig deeper into the solutions being offered with Sushant, Tomer, and Gavin. So Herb, uh, let's go to you first, and the floor is yours. First, uh, and then no questions until the end, right? Uh, until yes. the end of everybody speaking. Yeah, exactly. And just that's a, that's a good uh, reminder to all participants. Please do uh, pose your questions in the chat. As, as, as we go on with the presentations, they can be questions for individual presenters or for all of the panelists. So if you're joining on Facebook or other social media, please post your questions there or here on the BlueJeans platform. So yes, over to you, Herb. Okay, so um, is everybody seeing my screen right now? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so... Um... Well, I'm here to talk about uh, a little bit about the, um, the psychological and technological aspects of the emitting action on uh, these slides are available to anyone who, uh, who, who wants them. 
Okay, so this is the when I got the the invitation. Here, here's what I was uh, told. Uh, I, two questions were raised. Uh, uh, the the first was, what's the role of technology misinformation in disrupting climate action? The second is, how does second it, it, it is how do democracies respond? Can democracies respond uh, and ensure that citizens around the world get high quality information on ecological challenges? Now, I want to point out that that charge, that, that that second question presumes that it is a lack of high quality information that's responsible for inaction on climate. And if you believe that, then of course, the right solution is to provide more high quality information, which will lead, then lead to support for action and so on. Um, and uh, the essential theme of my talk is that ain't so. That is the, uh, it's not a lack of high quality information that is responsible. Next slide here. I want to present first the, uh, a little bit about the psychology of uh, thinking about this stuff. These are psychological elements which people need to keep in mind uh, as they uh, try to understand how to make progress. Um, people, uh, what undergirds, quote, belief, unquote? And, and I'm going to present sort of three things that that uh, that, that affect human cognition. Uh, the first is social identity. Uh, that is, people in groups or people often form in groups, uh, and th these people are highly motivated to establish a shared reality reality to to validate themselves. And that includes shared attitudes, emotions, feelings, uh, and, and 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 belief. And group identity. Group identity is threatened uh, when you get information that uh, contradicts uh, that shared reality, uh, and it's therefore rejected. So, as an example, there is this phenomenon known as motivated reasoning, uh, which is, is is that somehow after you've done all your careful analysis and so on, uh, you come out with the answer that you wanted in the first place. Some people might call that rationalization, uh, but it, it is a common and well-studied phenomena. The second uh, is what I'm going to call dual system cognitive theory. There are people, th th this is a, a uh, idea that was, uh, that's been advanced in the liter psychological literature for many years. Uh, it posits that uh, people have two ways of thinking. There's uh, a, a something called system one, which is low cost cognitively it's easy for people to use it's fast it's intuitive it's reflective it's heuristic most importantly it's always on and then there's the something that that people refer to often as system two which is high cost high high cognitive cost that's slow deliberate and analytical it's very careful uh, you have to think things through it's logical it's rule based and and, and so on best example of this is this picture on the right you know the you, this is the usual riddle uh, of is the mid which line in the center is longer and the answer of course is that they're the same but it still looks like the line, line at the top is bigger and at the bottom looks smaller even though it isn't and you either have to have seen this or you have to actually take some you know a uh, ruler uh, and see that they are the same size. That is, you have to invoke your a high cost methodology to determine what the real answer is because your eyes are telling you your low cost answer is uh, that those lines are uh, different length. Uh, the last point on this is, is that people's uh, Information processing capability is limited, uh, and that means that uh, people use uh, thinking strategies, low-cost thinking strategies, that minimize the mental effort to uh, so that they can get resources. Now, all of these things play into or uh, set up a, a fertile ground for technology to be very disruptive. Think about the volume, velocity, and veracity of information. Uh, in, in today's environment, the volume and velocity of information have gone up by a lot. There's a huge amount of information available, and it comes at you very quickly. High volume means you can only look at certain pieces of information, and then how do you make decisions about that? Um, high velocity means that you don't have time to think about anything. That means sick, your, your, your fast thinking skills are, uh, become much more prominent and are activated more 
more easily. Um, low veracity uh, means uh, that uh, there's a, a lower a priori likelihood that the information that comes your way is true. And, and, and so you, there, there, there's just no way of knowing uh, without actually thinking about it. Uh, there's documentation that says that technology use increases people's tendency to process information heuristically, that is using system one. Uh, some, there's some experimental studies on, on that. And you, you can see also that uh, the internet and social media and the fact that uh, we have constant access to our <clears throat> uh, technology uh, changes a lot. So for example, Search engines, uh, Google, uh, return what's popular rather than what's true, rather than what people, that it gives you people, people what they want rather than what they need. Uh, sort of, you could call this a kind of confirmation bias. Um, there are millions and millions of content providers around who can supply any kind of unvetted information to anybody who wants to see it. So you can get support for any point of view that you want. Anything that you want to, to believe, you can find somebody else who and that means that for, formal, formerly marginalized people can find affinity groups much more easily and they can much more easily be mainstreamed. Um, since these people group together, they, li they, they live in echo chambers. Uh, that, 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 that these chambers facilitate recirculation of false information among groups of like-minded. Um, furthermore, the, the devices are always on. Uh, Many of us, you know, right now have cell phones that are on and they are getting, we are getting messages and, and the like and notifications about new information uh, coming in. Uh, the, the apps are, are designed to let us know when there's new information. Uh, and we know that false, inf it's well documented that false information propagates faster than true information. And people are wired to want to see novelty, to see new inputs. Uh, and so uh, these notifications say, hey, there's something new here. You're, you're highly motivated to, to, to go look at it. Social media companies, they make money from ad revenue, uh, which, they, and they get ad revenue, uh, which increases with increasing user engagement. Users are engaged, are more engaged by sensationalistic and false information that fires emotion. Um, and rather than true information, which is sort of dull, uh, and, and you know, like functions and retweet and so on makes retransmission very easy. What the future holds, it's going to get worse. Uh, you're going to get forged uh, audio and visual uh, information, video clips, uh, audio clips and so on that are indistinguishable from the real. Um, you may be able to, to source these things for authenticity, but it won't matter because Tracing the provenance of, a, of something is a system two function. Uh, listening and hearing are play to, and, and, and viewing play to system one, and that will be dominant. Um, forged emails will mislead. These are gonna be forged not just by, not just hacked emails, just not leaked, but they'll be forged too. Um, uh, you'll be able to build detailed profiles of individuals who can be individually targeted uh, for uh, misinformation, get information specific, misinformation specifically customized to that person's prejudice. Uh, conversational chatbots can do mu much more than just retweet. Uh, they'll be able to engage one-on-one -on -one, uh, and, and, and persuade you that, persuade somebody that they are talking to a real person uh, and rather than a uh, bot. Um, AI GPT-3 software can create text that's nearly indistinguishable from human creation and it can do it at machine speed. Um, we know how to target individuals during times of emotional vulnerability, to increase their receptivity to messaging. So the, the, you think it's bad now? It is, it's gonna get worse. This is just, the, and, and these are just some uh, comments about the significance for climate change. And so, we find that this group identity business is, is very important uh, uh, with respect to climate change denial. The liberals, conservatives uh, pay attention to different numbers in the very same data tables. That's been documented. Um, uh, the framing is important, the way you talk about it. The phrase global warming is less acceptable than the phrase climate change, conservatives. Um, the point here being that the groups drive, because you're a member of a group, uh, you then adopt the beliefs of that group. 
and it doesn't go the other way. It, it, it's the idea is not that you believe in something and then you join a group that follows it so much as, as you're, or you're already uh, a member of a group and you adopt what they believe. So psychology talks about loss aversion, which is a strong opposition to anything that takes away from anything that I already enjoy. This is the, what's behind the American stance that climate change, that, that responding to climate change cannot take away from the American way of life. People have often, American politicians have often said that, um, and anything that, any change that you propose to the Americans that says you're going to have to do something less uh, be able to do have some some freedom of yours uh, uh, restricted uh, is politically unacceptable and death to uh, any politician who, who who proposes that. Um, people can hold simultaneously contradictory beliefs. Um, uh, they can believe the globe is cooling and that global warming, observed global warming is natural, and that human influence doesn't matter because warming is good for us. Um, all those things can exist in a uh, in the same context in, in, and in the same person that, that is consistency doesn't matter that's sort of the root of conspiracy thinking um people they want reasons to believe things that they like but they don't care about the reasons uh so for example um uh, there's a very interesting uh, study in, in, in 2000, sorry, in 1975, where people used to line up for Xerox, making Xerox copy. It turns out that, um, you know, if you let, somebody will let you cut ahead of them in line uh, if uh, they say, you know, can I get in front of you um, uh, uh, because I'm in, a, I'm in a rush, that's okay. And if you don't give them a reason, so you say, can I cut in front of you, they say no. But if you say, I, can I cut in front of you because I want to make some copies, which is, of course, a totally useless reason. Of course, that's what they want to do. Okay? It doesn't tell you why they want to do it. People still let you in. So people don't care about, they just want to hear something to the because part. They don't really care about what, what, what's in it. And so you can give them any kind of nonsense reason and they'll believe it. Um, people have inconsistent preferences. They're driven by local conditions. You know, was people are more serious about uh, global warming when today was hot uh, rather than when it was cool. Um, There's a psychological phenomenon in which people use averages rather than sums in evaluating the actions. So if I take some action that's good for the environment and some action that's bad for the environment uh, together, uh, they sort of average out as, well, okay, I, I can do one good thing and one bad thing. And, and, and sort of, I, I'm not making any net harm. Whereas, of course, you're really, you are harming. You're just harming less than you would have done if, than if you had done two bad things. Um, and I point out that the use of climate change as a wedge issue is also exploitable as a as a geopolitical weapon between nations. Okay, so Russians, in particular, have been known to uh, try to draw to to, to wedge. Uh, draw uh, draw lines uh, in between the uh, cleavages in the United States anyway um, about climate change. You know, getting the, the climate deniers and uh, and the good guys um, to fight with each other. Here are some of the takeaway lessons. Uh, better information is not the, the answer and will not by itself drive any kind of a change. People will not change because you tell them that they're wrong. Or even if they, they themselves discover that they are wrong, they're highly motivated to continue believing what they believe. Um, change, you have to accord them with respect uh, for their own values and meet on their own terms. That's very hard for most of us to do. And, and you know, we have a, a problem here where the, chi the time scales of change in human belief are very long compared to the urgent need for action. And we're stuck with that. And I don't know how to deal with that. So with that, um, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and yield the floor. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too long. That was fine. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that really brilliant but uh, sobering perspective, of course, on, on current issues, the intersection of these, these psychological tendencies with, with our current technology, current social media technology, but also uh, emerging technologies in, in the future. So, so many, it raises so many questions uh, for discussion, uh, how, how exactly, how we might put our heads together to, to address these, these dynamics. Um, but let's get to that in, in the question and answer, the discussion phase. 
Um, and at the moment, let's move next to, to Amy um, and, and talking about how one government uh, and, and maybe a comparative perspective of how governments might really dig into to build that democratic engagement and awareness among citizens and uh, also how technology might might help. What, what are governments doing at the moment in terms of democracy building, bringing citizens into engagement with, with climate action and, and perspectives on that? So Amy, it's over to you. Thank you, Maya. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. All right. Um, so, uh, what we just heard, I thought, was fascinating and scary all at the same time. I'm going to talk about something slightly different. Um, I'm going to talk about climate policy in the Netherlands and how we're using democratic process and citizen engagement to uh, strengthen that and how technology is helping or, or not. <laughs> um, so when I first read the title of the conference, um, Can Democracy Save the Environment? Um, I thought, well, of course, yes, I wanted to shout, like, what are we talking about? But then, of course, I thought about it for a moment. Um, and I thought, actually, that depends on what we mean by democracy. So um, I decided to approach the next few minutes uh, from the perspective of, perspective of what democracy is and what role technology might play in that. Um, so the spoiler is my position, um, which I'm going to work to in the next few minutes, is that technology provides many aids and tools that can be super powerful um, in building strong climate policy, but that without overcoming some of the more low tech obstacles, um, it can end up being quite pointless. Can. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's happening in the Netherlands uh, regarding climate policy and citizen engagement. Um, so we are struggling actually to meet our 49% CO2 reduction targets for 2030. Um, and this is partially at least due to a lack of support from the measures for the measures introduced uh, by government from the public. Um, and one of the ways it's being considered um, to overcome this is citizen assemblies. Now, um, I'm sure you've heard of them before. They've been applied in other countries um, like Belgium, Ireland, the UK most recently. Um, and they're a group of randomly selected uh, citizens, uh, a representative group between 50 and 150. And, and th with this group, a process um, is undertaken of firstly information giving and sharing. Um, and moving on towards deliberation. And from that, um, this group of, of representative group of citizens provides um, advice to the government on climate policy. So the interesting technolo technological aspect of this is being forced upon us really through the corona crisis. All of a sudden, everything has had to move online. Um, and it's been a real help because otherwise there's no way you could have 150 uh, people from all across the country together in one room uh, at the moment or a few months ago, definitely not. Um, and also activists started using not only in-person um, activities, but also online activities to push for this kind of um, citizen engagement. So that's something the government is now um, seriously looking into as a, as a um, policy tool. The other thing that the government has been um, using, well, has been given actually, is uh, a certain research tool. Um, we call it PWE, which means uh, participatory value evaluation, which is a bit of an odd name because you don't really know what it means when you when you hear that. But actually, it's an online tool um, to engage citizens in policymaking. It was built by the Technical University in Delft, and uh, they built this kind of dashboard, which uh, and they also asked, I think, uh, around 20,000 citizens to fill in. Um, and their four citizens are forced to make decisions for, for, um, for policy choices. So, for instance, you would have dials and you could, uh, for instance, have all the budget go into uh, wind or solar energy. Um, and the panel will show you how many megaton 
for instance, have been um, have been saved by you, uh, uh, putting all your funds into a certain uh, policy choice. Um, the outcomes of this kind of research uh, are also shared with the ministry and the minister um, on, on economic affairs and climate um, so that they can use that kind of information to um, develop stronger policy. So what these examples do is basically show you how technology can help. It provides us with a number of opportunities, um, access of information and networks um, for policy development. Um, it, support, it supports interaction between citizens that might usually not meet or speak to each other, and also between citizens and policymakers. Um, and it uh, offers some extra level of transparency in decision making. In turn, um, those opportunities support democracy and the climate, because firstly, democracy needs renewal, right? Our um, society is changing, citizens are looking for new ways to connect, and uh, they want to feel that they belong, and they want to feel heard, and they want to be represented, and technology offers that kind of opportunity. Also, higher levels of consensus-driven participation um, seem to lead to more inclusive and pro-climate policy decisions. So in the end, that inclusiveness that technology can offer uh, leads to stronger climate change uh, or climate policy. Finally, though, um, the challenges, like P3s, three Ps. Um, the low tech bumps in the road that I referred to earlier. Um, firstly, the people. So. Differences in age and experience can really impact how and who engages digitally. Uh, my dad still swears that his phone calls me by accident all the time. Um, and even though, <laughs> so technology is really only as good as its, as its users. And then uh, the next point is face-to-face -face interaction is often preferred. Even though a lot can be achieved online, the informality or even formality that can be achieved in face-to-face -face, uh, interactions uh, can be lost. So as far as technology and citizen participation is concerned, we need to really accept that there are boundary, boundaries to what technology can do and we need to find hybrid ways uh, to engage. So my ne next P is a very Dutch um, thing, the classic approach to uh, political uh, consensus is the Polder model. So here, political solutions are found through this process of stakeholder compromise. It's the way we've done it for a long, long time, and it's difficult to change. But the climate crisis actually needs more than just stakeholders and representatives at the table. It needs everybody to be behind the changes and the policy and the action that are needed. Um, so we need to look at new ways of building new types of relationships between government and citizens. Um, and then finally, politics. So voting patterns, um, it turns out that 80% of Dutch voters think climate change is important, but that um, they will always vote uh, along the lines of economy and migration before climate. So what happens is you, of course, get uh, parties that don't prioritize climate change or climate policy. And then finally, uh, on the politics side, there's an assumption that governments and politicians are interested in more citizen engagement, um, when in fact they often see it as a threat to their own position of power. They either find it difficult to understand what that engagement means or uh, prefer not to know in detail because they feel that they've been voted in already so they have the mandate to act on behalf of uh, their constituency. So when it comes to change processes, uh, leaders need to set an example at some point, and um, we'll need to find ways to make um, those in power more open to engagement. So finally, in conclusion, uh, yes, democracy can save the environment, and yes, technology has an important role to play in engaging citizens in policy making, but technology can only offer certain tools and aids, um, and the political culture has to be open enough first. Uh, to entertain the idea of change. So that's it. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Amy, so much for another fascinating uh, presentation.
and really talking about, you know, the foundations of, of the non-tech or low-tech tools and, and hybrid environments and, and, and different factors that have to be thought of at the same time as, as technology tools, really fascinating and, and helpful. Uh, let's move next then to some of the, the technological solutions and platforms that we, ha that we have and, and that are some of the leading and most innovative solutions. Um, uh, Sushant, uh, you're up next to talk about your work at Sway and, and beyond uh, with reference to this topic, please. Thank you, Maya. Uh, I hope everyone hears me okay. Uh, and I'll take the next few minutes to try to uh, answer this question of whether democracy can save the environment and whether technology can play a role in that. Uh, incredible lineup of, of speakers. I'm really humbled to be here. Um, let me share my screen and hopefully everyone sees what, what I see here. So the task, I think, or the requested opinion was, you know, speak to uh, how AI and current tech trends uh, on engaging citizens can enhance democratic decision making around the world uh, in relation to the unprecedented crises we face. Uh, we just finished a, a very large and prominent pilot with the UN Secretary General Office around uh, collecting proposals uh, instead of opinions, uh, proposals for reforming certain functions and aspects of the UN to become more future compatible. And I think that experience uh, is, is where I see, where I'd like to see a lot of democratic institutions move. But before kind of jumping into this, I think it's important to you know, set the stage, set the context. Uh, this morning, of, of all the you know newspapers in the world, TechCrunch is writing about the IPCC uh, report on climate change, and they're sounding the code red for the planet. Um, you know, the, the ones are stern and conclusive. Uh, the IPCC report, uh, the latest one in 2021, uh, says that it's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere. Uh, and to, you know, skip all these fancy words, we've basically used about 86% of our carbon budget today. Uh, temperatures have already ri risen by 1.1 degree. Uh, if we continue at the same pace, we will shoot into the 3.2 degree increase uh, status. So we have about 10 years uh, to get everything sorted. Uh, the good news is 2016 Paris Accord, 120 countries committed to hard dates and hard targets to achieve net zero, but we haven't really seen much in the way of policy commitments materializing. Uh, in 2020, we saw GHG emissions fall by 7%, but this was due to COVID uh, and the ensuing economic slowdown, not because of decarbonization policy being prioritized over domestic industrial policy. And that's really the, the issue at hand. It's not whether political will and, and you know, citizen engagement uh, has played a very material role in this. It's that the governments we end up electing in and the set of options that are presented or that they tend to prioritize uh, tends to uh, prioritize domestic industrial policy that runs counter to decarbonization, decarbonization policy. And the current view, I think uh, previous speaker also uh, shared this from the perspective of, of more traditional voters, uh, going green is seen as some counter to, to the economy, it's almost economic burden. People have different things that they prioritize when they're at the ballot box. And the imperative is like really to make going green a competitive advantage or, or something else. So yeah, the, the current reality is the changes are arriving faster and worse than anticipated. And, and it makes you question like, where is the hope? Uh, is it in tech solutions and citizen mobilization or are future crises going to catalyze uh, change? So kind of coming back to this question of uh, can democracy save the environment? Democracy right now suffers from a huge crisis of confidence. And I, I just want to talk about this before we jump into the solutions, uh, because I, I feel like 
solutions need to account for why we have a crisis of confidence. Uh, can, you know, the, the real question is, can democracies in crisis save the climate crisis? And the first question is, like, can democracy save itself before the environment? Um, right now, as a citizen in most democratic uh, countries, in most democratic processes, having your voice heard feels like this. Even in more progressive, uh, you know, states and, and cities where they're really collecting opinions uh, versus solutions. Um, most democratic institutions and most organizations are designed this way, hierarchical kind of pyramid structures, you know, uh, leveraging representation uh, to, to determine viewpoints and whatnot and, and, you know, set agendas. But even when there are good ideas throughout society from citizens or from different uh, aspects, putting them in front of those that matter, being included in decision-making processes feels like this. Which is why most of these ideas kind of die on the vine, whether they're good or bad. And, and more troubling is that those that actually wanted to contribute end up feeling extremely apathetic, uh, disengaged, and mistrustful. And if you start to look at some of the research that's been coming out over the past few years, dissatisfaction with democratic performance uh, has been rising over the years. Uh, Pew did, did a very interesting research uh, study looking at 27 countries and found that 51% of people are dissatisfied with how democracy is working and they're resentful about democratic outcomes. Uh, and this dissatisfaction is increasing globally. It's not, you know, based on the West and so on. It's in many, many different countries spanning very different models of democracy. But it, it sort of dovetails or uh, complements a, a more troubling trend where there's there's been declining trust in governments for several years, starting from the 60s up until, you know, present day, uh, you know, uh, reality. And if you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, this is a 2017 um, study that was done. This one was the most troubling for me, where trust not only in government, but in all other major institutions around the world had declined below 50% for the first time trust in business, media, government, and NGOs. If I can fast forward a little bit, I mean, there's a lot of these pessimistic, uh, uh, you know, stats to share. You know, the global protests are, are more widespread than, than ever before. The consequence young people don't think democracy is essential moving forward. These are latest uh, stats that came from HBR uh, in a 2020 report, but this seems to be from at the core of it, this massive distrust in most things that are centralized. People trust government less, they don't go to church as much, they don't trust the banks, and you know, they don't no longer trust tech companies. You see that trend as well. At the same time, we're living in a time when you know rockets are landing themselves and cars are driving themselves and money is managing itself. And it feels like we're we're progressing at two different velocities. Technology and society are moving forward at an exponential uh, and accelerated rate, whereas our governance processes and our deliberative processes and our, our methods and tools for including people are, you know, our ability to upgrade our um, assumptions and, and beliefs is moving at a very linear and maybe even a regressive pace. And it's leading to this thing we call a, a democratic trust system where the accelerating problems and complexity and social expectations are exceeding our ability to deal with them in an effective way and causing a lot of this mystery. So when I think of solutions and, you know, Sway being one and whatnot, I think the, the main solution to solving this is to have radically more democracy, more people involved in decision-making processes, not just gathering their opinion or having them answer a, a poll, but present to them the types of challenges that the decarbonization uh, uh, progress is facing. You know, the, the issues with, with inconsistent policies or the prioritization of certain groups of, uh, of actors against the interest of, of the economy or against the interest of the climate. And 
invite citizens to imagine new solutions that account for uh, you know transitions of different different sectors to become uh, more aligned with these with the trajectory we want to go on and, and other stuff. The, the impact of of a more bottom up, more solutions oriented, uh, meritocratic type of process is that the legitimacy of the system restores people's engagement uh, in in these processes increases tremendously, and you have a whole other set of solutions to potentially draw on that currently aren't on the table because no one is being asked and there's no systems in place to really bring those ideas forward. So I want to respect uh, time. I, I can go into uh, you know a lot more data and stuff around uh, why I think this way and, and studies that have been done in, in other you know low democratic environments that have experimented with radical democratic processes like participatory budgeting and the impact of these on on tax collection and tax evasion and this sort of stuff but i think there's some really really fascinating and promising uh trends to, to draw on uh that require really brave leadership and for us to imagine how our democracies and our democratic institutions could function and look different um Thanks for your time. I look forward to the questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Sushant, for another uh, really excellent presentation, talking about these broader trends across our societies and echoing, you know, a lot of what Amy was saying also about the need to, you know, get back to basics, the need or the requirement for really excellent leadership and leadership commitment uh, to, to, democracy and enhancing the, the really basic foundations of, of citizen engagement, uh, which is something interesting for discussion, how we might take advantage of, of some of these processes that you mentioned, Sushant, the participatory budgeting, um, Amy mentioned the citizen assemblies, et cetera, and how technology, of course, can, can support that. Thank you. So let's move next then to Tomer about uh, his, his work. Uh, at Climate View and how they're using tech platforms and how that is interfacing with uh, various democratic environments. Tomar, over to you. Thank you and thanks. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, I think I'll, I'll start uh, where Sushant uh, left off uh, on um, you know, how to democratize uh, uh, democratizing climate knowledge and uh, daring daring uh, more people to be involved. Uh, just before I dive down, so we're um, talking about democracy uh, and who we're communicating with. I just, for the context here, sort of not oh, just talking about politicians and the voters, but this, this sort of entire system here of, of, uh, poly, of, of the politicians, the policymakers, the high level, the high level bureaucrats, the city bureaucrats, etc. We have all these levels of, of decision making. And I must say, going into this, you know, <laughs> reading a bit of like the, the dear message we got there in the beginning, that there's, what is hap there's a lot, a lot of people out there that actually want change, and, and there's a lot of good possibility to empower those on the good side, to, so to speak. So a lot of what I'm talking about is how do we empower, not how do we, how do we fight the climate denies, I'm not talking about that, but how do we empower those that want change, but want change to happen faster. So actually, so how do we use technology to 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 uh, to help us decimate the knowledge that's needed to make the change happen? So uh, Climate View started about uh, three years ago uh, with um, um, uh, helping uh, actually with the Swedish Climate Co Policy Council. We are now working with six countries and actually focusing on helping cities with their climate transitions and. I'll give an example of uh, some very good democratic work done in Sweden. Uh, this is the uh, road to a climate positive future uh, just come out. It's like 850 pages of quite a, quite good uh, uh, and detailed descriptions of how the con transition can happen and how it's actually a positive ROI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem about this is that it's quite hard to access this knowledge although a lot, a lot of people actually need to get at it. So can we use technology to reach it better? So I'm showing you here, 
what is, I'll show you the dashboard and actually dive into some of the data. This is the Swedish Climate Policy Council's uh, web page uh, running Climate, climate OS. Uh, showing Sweden's pathway to net zero. So just to make sure you're, you're seeing my screen. Good. Okay, so we have Sweden's emissions uh, and Sweden has a net zero goal and we want and we have uh, reductions that need to be made to 2045 and these are where the reductions need to happen within transport, industry, agriculture. And if I look where the shifts happen to ha have to happen within transport, where we have private transport which being the biggest part of right transport needed, other transport systems, if we look at how we're we going to solve the shift of private transport, well, we have transport efficient society, better energy efficiency, renewable fuels, these buckets are quite general. And if we look at transport efficient society, we're talking about shift to public transport, a shift to walking and cycling, transfer from car to rail over long distance travel, increased more non-travel meeting and services. Now dive all the way down to the uh, public transport, this path here shows the path that Sweden needs to take of proportion of public transport from about 10 to 21 percent of transport needed. The path has to go, has to follow this path and we're actually quite, doing quite well. And here, Belize, we have all the policies and actions in place in Sweden to try and make this shift happen. And you can go all the way in and look at the details and go all the way to the government websites and read about it. So this way, what we've actually helped do in Sweden is take the entire climate transition and break it down into all these different goals where we can follow how we're doing and how we are not doing, such as uh, if we look at, for example, the car usage and, and, and uh, how many pa passengers per car is going completely in the wrong direction. So basically broken down the entire Swedish transition into these what we call transition targets where each one of these icons represents a transformation, a shift that needs to happen, a shift in how we provide a service to society from high carbon to low carbon. And then, and then I'll go in slightly behind the scenes and see, so actually what we're going to provide here is so the public and any policymaker can actually uh, build scenarios and understand what would the shift be if we are one fourth of the workforce works from home. This would be the carbon, uh, the carbon abatement. What would the shift be of 20% electrification by 2030? That would be the trajectory. And to that, there is all the, and this way you can set the shifts for all transformations of society and build and, tr and find the pathway. And very importantly, this can be done easily and interactive. Manner. And then all the parameters that are used, all the calculations that are used here are all public and each and every data point down to the nitty gritty detail. Um, so uh, this way we are trying to provide um, a complete uh, transparency uh, of the climate transition going all the way from the absolute detail to what we hope is a storytelling mechanism to actually show uh, um, to, to actually show how the transition can happen um, and make things difficult calculations and carbon uh, carbon emission calculations etc that are published in books like this make them completely accessible so that when it comes to the physics and the energy change and the economic change of the transition, things that are actually uh, arguably objective uh, assessments of how the future can be, um, we can, we can have, have those facts at our fingertips so that we can focus on the things that are harder to exactly know and that is what kind of pot, what what kind of policies and actions, what, uh, how will a policy and action change the actual behaviors that make these shifts happen? Um, but, but so by presenting all this data this way, um, we, um, we ha are having an ability to involve more of the um, 
all the way from the policymakers to the to the uh, government officials, but actually all the way down to um, f uh, like Fridays for Future, uh, Extinction Rebellion, etc. Because we have all these movements in the civil society that really want to be part of the change, um, but somehow don't get access to all the knowledge because. We can, in some ways, I don't know how much I dare re reference to lift the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but the opening scene of that, I'm sure many of you have read, is the world gets demolished and the aliens invading are saying, but hang on, this, this, was, uh, this was known for the world a long time ago. We published it on Beta Google 5 uh, Galaxy a long time ago. It's the same thing with climate transitions. There is lots of data out there, but it isn't made accessible. And we think that by making it accessible, uh, we can empower those that actually want to drive change. I think I'll finish there and I kept my seven minutes. <laughs> Fantastic, Tamar. What a, a brilliant uh, tool um, that you and colleagues have developed. And can I just ask one small follow-up question at this point? Who, who is using uh, the Climate View approach? You mentioned the Swedish government at the national level, uh, I think, uh, but are there other governments? Is, is, it, is it mostly at the city level, or, or what, what, what is the appetite or the scope for uptake at the moment? Actually, very good question. I should have said that. So uh, it's actually, we started with the Swedish government, and that was great, um, but what we very early on found uh, was that cities was the place to go for several good reasons. Uh, cities, first of all, are actually, on a democratic perspective, much closer to the citizen. Uh, cities are also the drivers of the transition in so much of the things that need to be do, the investments that need to happen, the the because it's about transport, it's about it's about how we live, uh, it's, it's about heating. So the cities are also the drivers of so much that has to happen. They're either the investors or have to catalyze the right kind of investment. Guide cities in that is actually often a, a linchpin to make the transition happen. If and if the cities aren't doing it, then the cities have to be empowered with the tools to tell their governments what needs to happen, because cities will actually know that better. Uh, also, cities are very interesting in the sense that they actually want to share knowledge. They actually have it in their DNA and their core. And they, 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 one of the reasons, they, they want to share their knowledge. So when they start using this platform, and so the very important aspect of it is that for every new user that enters the data, the models become slightly better. The assumptions become slightly better. The, the storytelling becomes slightly richer. So, and the cities like that. So if you can compare that with work with companies, now we have something else where cities build this network of sharing with each other. Um, so, uh, and also, interestingly enough, cities where bravely underserved of existing tools. So basically the only alternative cities had for climate action planning was big, big Excel spreadsheets uh, served by some kind of uh, consultancy company of some kind. And usually a big city, well, they can afford it. They can even afford a McKinsey if it's a, if it's a capital, but any small city will not have the access to the consultancy needed. So in essence, we have cities which are the drivers, the catalysts of climate change, uh, to, to make things happen, they are closer to their citizens, they want to share data, and they're underserved of tools. So that's why we felt that cities is where we start working. Uh, so it was great to start with the Swedish government, and that gave us access to a massive amount of knowledge and, and, and models. But then working with cities, we think, is the best thing we can do to address climate change. Excellent. Thank you very much for that clarification. And it's really fascinating also what you say about empowering citizen groups and civil society that, that so needs access to such uh, digestible and accessible information. Um, brilliant. Okay, on this transfer transparency theme um, and access to information, let's move on to Gavin for our last presentation. Gavin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, hope everyone can see these slides. So I just wanted to say that um, I, I don't know about everyone else in the audience, but I thought those were some pretty remarkable presentations. So I'm in the unusual position of actually being a little bit persuaded in a debate. 
So um, I was planning on giving a talk really emphasizing uh, transparency, and I'd actually like to change my tune a little bit. So apologies if some of the things I'm going to say are actually not totally in line with my slides. But um, starting with what you had to say, um, Professor Lin, about uh, it's not always the case that better emissions or better information actually persuades anyone. I really wanted to lean into this theme and in strong agreement with, with what Tomer and others were saying about um, what we have really seen in our work is um, empowering the many, many individuals and organizations who do want to see a change uh, is something technology can often do much better than um, changing the minds of those who don't want to see a change. And um, so I'm going to talk about transparency, but also a little bit more than I was intending about um, what you can do about it if you are one of the many organizations or individuals who feels a little bit left out sometimes. Um, so apologies for the strange opener there. Um, I'm Gavin McCormick from Watt Time um, and uh, representing the Climate Trace Coalition. The uh, context of my work is that uh, the Climate Trace Coalition is a group of now 14 nonprofits, universities, and companies um, using artificial intelligence and satellite imagery to measure emissions from space. So um, in context, uh, the IPCC and others have known for a very long time how much emissions are in the atmosphere. We've uh, had excellent measures in this for decades. But a little known fact is that we actually don't always know where those emissions are coming from. So in sharp contrast to the high quality information that you just saw in the data set that Tomer shared, in many, many places around the world, we don't really know what the sources of emissions are. That's because the global standard in most emissions monitoring still remains to ask the polluters what they are doing. And so we have a global ecosystem that um, is very, very clear that climate change is happening, but has a little bit of a sense of uh, hot potato in terms of sometimes emitters don't want to be uh, as direct in measuring emissions as they could be. Uh, there have been a few cases of uh, deliberate falsification of data, but, but really more than that, the problem is that many institutions don't have it in their best interest to ensure detailed emissions measurement. Also, sometimes it's not possible to get high quality information quickly. We have a global system that essentially depends on manual self-reporting uh, by institutions, and it kind of depends on uh, companies like Volkswagen to be interested in handing over data. And that means that um, it is harder to build climate solutions than it would be if we had global, transparent, easily accessible information. It appears at first glance sometimes that we do have that because there are countless organizations that count and analyze emission statistics. But what a lot of people haven't focused on as much is that um, the vast majority of this data actually comes from other experts who process data, which comes from other databases that process data, that all come back to the same source data, which is fundamentally asking those who have done the polluting how much they polluted. And while I don't want to encourage any conspiracy theories, I actually think the amount of disinformation in the system is very, very small. It's actually remarkable how honest the vast majority of emitters have been. We still believe as a coalition that having independent third party reporting on emissions would add a lot of trust to the system. And I mentioned I might change my tune here. I kind of wanted to mention that our original hypothesis coming into this work is that there will be widespread disinformation and uh, emitters hiding how much pollution they have. And that by, quote, catching the bad guys and exposing sources of false information, we would build an accountability ecosystem. I think what we've really come to learn that, in fact, the vast majority of data are reliable. The vast majority of emitters, even, even coal plants and oil companies, are, are remarkably honest in their reporting. But the level of trust in the system is so low because nobody can be sure that anybody else is telling the truth. We've heard from a number of climate negotiators that one thing holding back stronger uh, climate commitments in the Paris Agreement is that nobody is sure that anybody else is telling the truth. So I think it's very relevant to the forum here that um, we started out with a hypothesis that what we're going to do is catch bad guys. And I think that what we've increasingly been finding is that confirming how many people are telling the truth, confirming how many organizations are being completely straightforward, but verifying that in an independent way is increasingly where we see more impact coming from our work. So we use satellites to look at uh, emissions globally. I'll move pretty quickly through the technology, but the thing I wanted to highlight is artificial intelligence can feel like a real black box sometimes. It can be very unclear and disempowering to say, oh, we use some AI algorithms and big data to find the answer. But fundamentally what we're doing is we are looking at pictures of pollution from space, and we are training an algorithm to say things like, hey, in the picture on the right, 
it's pretty obvious this power plant is polluting. On the picture on the left, this power plant is turned off right now. And so by pairing information sourced from a wide variety of cities and governments and companies who are really interested to donate information, we can say, all right, at times when we saw pollution was happening, what did it look like? And at times when it wasn't happening, what did it look like? And we can train an AI to analyze that everywhere in the world at once. This works better because we can combine many different types of data. So hypothetically, if one data source were falsified, the fact that we are looking from many different sources created by many different actors with different incentives using different forms of imagery and big data means it would be very, very hard for intentional misreporting to go on. When you're using infrared and comparing it to the visual signal, you are comparing the government data to the emitter's own data, it becomes pretty hard to have misinformation. Whether anyone will believe it, of course, is a different question. But we can pretty accurately figure out what's going on in emissions. Um, I work at Watt Time and we monitor power plant emissions. And I thought I would just quickly mention one of the really interesting things about the Climate Trace Coalition is just how many nonprofits, universities, companies, and governments are starting to use similar techniques for similar forms of emissions monitoring. So we ended up in this very decentralized group. No one's in charge of Climate Trace, but we've got 14 core members and about 50 institutions sharing AI, imagery, and common databases to make global emissions transparent using similar techniques with different types of sensors. So here are some of the members that have come together to make this possible, most notably Al Gore. Um, and I wanted to sort of talk about how our original hypothesis for this data is that what transparency was going to do is make it possible for people to hold their governments accountable or for governments to hold other governments accountable. I think what we've learned is that it doesn't work like that. It's not really the case that you can instantly persuade anyone, even if the data are completely true and verified, that they are true. And it's not necessarily the case that um, countries are holding each other accountable to their climate promises in negotiations. So it is true that building trust and making sure that everybody knows that everybody else is telling the truth and finding the rare cases where that's not going on, that can be really valuable. But what I have been um, increasingly discovering is that emissions data and technology can do a lot more than just accountability. And one of the new solutions that um, governments are just slowly realizing democracy can do a lot more than it thinks is finding win-win solutions with data. So increasingly, for example, we can use satellites from space. In addition to measuring the emissions of power plants, we can measure the profitability of power plants. And one of our coalition members, Transition Zero, was able to prove that just about every coal plant in the world right now is losing money. And it would actually make more money to have renewable energy. So why is it that we still have a lot of coal plants? What we are finding is that increasingly, anywhere there is um, a profit maximizing market, investors are getting out of coal, closing it down, going renewable, and uh, that's not happening everywhere. So Transition Zero is, is exposing this information and making it possible for actors to kind of know, uh, maybe in a lot of cases there's not a trade-off between uh, emissions and finances. And what we are seeing is that democracies world around um, have been faster to decarbonize in the energy sector, um, and uh, organizations that are uh, more regulated monopolies or state-run organizations have been a little slower to do that. And we believe that one thing the project can do is make information available to everyone about all of the many cases in which there is no trade-off between emissions and finances. But the third use case I just quickly wanted to mention is that um, data also puts entirely new solutions on the table. So for example, um, California was able to use high quality emissions information to improve the carbon footprint of their energy storage sector uh, by 100% in six months. And so we're increasingly finding that the debate often focuses a lot on accountability and blame. And I just wanted to put a plug in here that one of the things we're seeing that, that grassroots activism can do is change the equation and put new opportunities on the table where there is no loser in this story. So this was interesting because it was about the carbon footprint of the energy storage industry but they actively requested that the government regulate them to decrease their emissions because what they concluded is that using technology, it was possible to do this essentially at zero cost and their own customers would be happier if they were using green solutions now. So I just wanted to make a plug that I think one of the big things emissions data can do is just find solutions where there are no losers and everyone is a winner and really empower coalitions, not necessarily of the um, everyone, 
but many, many, many organizations and people who want to see climate progress, making it possible for them to do so uh, in situations where there kind of is no pushback. Thanks for your time, and I know I went over, so I'll stop here. <laughs> Wonderful, Gavin. Thank you so, so much for another excellent presentation and this really fascinating point that, that you were making about sort of the secondary effects of, of having this high quality accessible data. And also I found, you know, your point that these new opportunities are finding solutions with no losers, like these very, very positive solutions that are then, uh, you know, able to be quickly implemented speaks to what some of the other speakers were, were mentioning about the need for positive messages uh, uh, on, on the climate action front and to connect the dots so, so that you do get this energetic and positive uh, citizen and, and, and other engagement. Brilliant. So uh, we have about now 20 minutes or a little bit less for, for questions and discussion. So what I'd suggest we do is uh, to move uh, quite swiftly to our youth discussants. We have three youth discussants who are affiliated with the World Forum for Democracy. Um, I'll just introduce them extremely briefly and uh, perhaps they can ask their questions uh, all at once uh, and then uh, the panelists can, can respond. Um, and we can see also if we're getting any other questions on, on social media or, or elsewhere. So first we have Carmen Gerardo Tabarada. She is part of the Global Challenge NGO in Spain. Uh, she's participated in many activities uh, related to sustainability, the SDGs and human development. Next we have Elena Manso Palau. She's Madrid's ambassador for, for youth and a member of the El Generacional in Spain. And third, we have Doyana Blanco Quiroga. She's a youth activist for climate change and women's indigenous rights in Bolivia. So very warm welcome to the three of you. Um, we're so grateful to have you here as discussants. So, um, Carmen, uh, uh, would you like to start with, with your questions to the panelists or to an individual panelist? Is Carmen with us? Okay. So, uh, when thinking about my questions, I wanted to ask for possible solutions that include altogether dem democratic matters, technology, and environment. So, I have two questions, all related to urban sustainability. So, the first one is about smart cities. Uh, so, taking into account this concept of urban sustainability, it is the proliferation of these smart cities like Singapore or many other Chinese and European ones, a good path development to follow, like to structure a city, is this a solution? It is like possibly positively correlated with more sustainability, especially taking into account problems with the right to private life, image, and also data protection. And the second question is about electric cars as um, urban mobility represents the highest emissions of carbon. Uh, I wanted to ask if the electric car is the solution for urban mobility in the future, and mainly what are the main pros and cons of the introduction of these electric cars in urban mobility plans? That's it. Great, thank you. So, so if I understand correctly, two main questions about pathways to development. And then also about electric cars and if this is a mobility solution uh, for the future. Thank you so much. Let's move then to Elena, if you want to pose your, your question or questions. So, um, first of all, hi, everyone, and thank you for your interventions. They, they filled me with hope, and uh, I think that many of our, many of our part who are currently seeing this will also be very encouraged to take action after this meeting. So I wanted to focus my question on some of the interventions which have been done here. The first one would be for Amy about the citizen assemblies held and not only at the Netherlands, but also at many other countries such as France or Spain. And I wanted to ask about the feasibility of these citizen assemblies to really make a change in policy and how could maybe um, we assure that they have binding power, a certain guarantee so that they're uh, demands can be solved. Um, and then the, the other two questions would be directed more uh, towards Tomar and also towards the last initiative, which was about climate trace. Um, and my question would be how, how to make sure that these wonderful initiatives that are present and are real 
are actually um, afterwards um, they can be used by governments because how can we encourage our governments to use these like um, uh, like Thomas initiative how could I uh, push a movement in my city so that they can uh, start to use this initiative and how can we make uh, initiatives like climate trace gain visibility you know strategies media uh, to the general public and to people who are already interested and um, these would be my, my two approaches for the question. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those, those two uh, main questions. Uh, firstly, about citizen assemblies and then climate trace and uh, climate view about how uh, youth and others can really encourage their governments to embrace these platforms. Wonderful. Let's move now to Diana, uh, if she's here, to pose her questions. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, thank you so much for this talk. I, I appreciate it. But how a representative of indigenous communities, uh, I have a question. How democracy save environment in Latin America when we have many problems with our governments, like corruption? Thank you so much. Thank you. An excellent question, straight to the point, uh, and a difficult question. Wonderful. Okay. With those uh, questions in mind, let's go through our, our speakers, and perhaps in, just in the order that they they presented, and individual speakers can 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 respond to to one or several of of the questions raised. So, Professor Lin uh, Herb, can we start with you if you have any? Comments. And can I just also squeeze in a tiny little question <laughs> as moderator about whether you think uh, the response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the information ecosystems, you know, private action and, and, and measures by private companies, government, has any lessons for, for the climate and environment space also? So, sorry, Herb, over to you. Uh, I'll, yes. Um... Uh, I, I think that what, what we have seen with COVID, uh, COVID crisis is a proliferation of misinformation and, and, and dysfunction, especially in, in, in big, you know, certainly in the United States. Um, I've seen it in Brazil too, and you know, in a, in a variety of other countries. Um, and so uh, I think that is what we are going to be facing when we, when the world finally comes to grips with with, with uh, climate change uh, again. Probably the, 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 the difference is that the climate change issue is something that unfolds slowly. And when something unfolds slowly, it's very difficult to see any change on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month basis. That's something that unfolds over, over years. Um, I still, I continue to believe that this information is going to be of, of the form, I don't mean about companies lying about their 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 outputs. Of course, that is a possibility, and, and anything you can do to hold them uh, to prevent them in the future from lying about it is good. Um, but I think it's going to be more along the lines of, I, you know, you can't make me give up my car. Electric cars actually are not particularly feasible in the United States um, for people who, who drive long distances. You have to build out the infrastructure and all that sort of stuff. And the psychology of all that says that people who have to drive long distances now will continue to want to drive long distances because they like the rural environment. Try to take that away from them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's very helpful um, in terms of all of us trying to think about how we can approach, approach these issues in the, in the future. And, this really important psychological dynamic combined with our information ecosystems and, and the technology. Let's move to Amy then next. Amy, you had a question in particular about citizen assemblies and anything else you would like to address. Yes, thanks. Um, firstly, the electric car question I think is a fascinating one because what you're suggesting is that actually we don't change the way we view mobility. But that we just continue in the way we've always continued, but that we change a, a, a petrol car for an electric one. But in fact, the question is bigger. If we need to change 
fundamentally, we need to look at different ways of uh, approaching mobility. Um, but it's really hard. I mean, I myself have been looking at buying a car recently, and I really don't want one, but I need to be mobile because I have a small child. And I've been trying to look at sharing options and sharing bikes and sharing scooters and sharing cars, and they're all not quite as handy as, as having your own car. So we really need to think outside the box and move beyond this sort of one family, one car option, I think. All right, back to the real question that was for me, uh, citizens' assemblies. So um, when it comes to sort of how to make them work, I think was the general question there. How can you make sure that the outcomes of an assembly are really used in policy making? So there's a couple of issues here. Firstly, um, uh, a citizens' assembly needs a very clear mandate and question. So what is it exactly you're asking of these people? And they have to have, the assembly has to have, there has to be a decision to be made. If there's no choice available or the decision has already been made by government, then you're asking the wrong question. Um, and it has to be extremely clear what's being expected of them. Is it something that's a very general answer or do you want very clear policy ideas? Um, the next thing is the process itself has to be very transparent. It has to be very open about who is participating, what questions are being asked, what speakers are being uh, introduced, etc. Um, because otherwise it becomes a sort of back door, back room, closed door type of conversation. And then all of a sudden they come with these great ideas. You don't know how they've come about. Um, and that could be, you know, through lobbying or something else which you want to try and prevent in this situation. And then finally, it's actually about the political commitment. And this is the key here. Um, so the Belgians started with their first national citizen assembly back in 2000 or something. Uh, and it was organized by a group of academics and NGOs. And it was a great process. They had some really strong outcomes. But there was absolutely no political engagement until the assembly itself came with these suggestions. So the government said, great, thank you, good ideas. We're going to do what we want to do anyway. And recently, we've had, we've had them in the UK, in Ireland, et cetera. And then the example uh, most recently is in France, where President Macron said, OK, guys, whatever you come up with, we are going to put to Parliament. We're going to take on board. Uh, but I'm going to have three jokers. So I've got three chances to say, OK, this is so ridiculous. We're going to take this, <laughs> take this out of the list of things to do. And we're going to um, apply everything else you suggest. And of course, everybody says, that's great. Uh, but just down the road, more recently, Macron said, actually, well, yes, here's our end result. And it had nothing to do with the 150 suggestions of citizens' assembly. So they feel completely at this kind of political commitment issue. Um, so if you're going to do something like this, and, and Macron did a great job. He put it, you know, it was really out there. It was highly publicized. It was uh, this, they threw a lot of money at it, and it was very transparent. It was all the other things it should be. Uh, but then when push came to shove, he decided that actually it wasn't quite quite what they were looking for and they were going to go do their own thing anyway. Nobody's ever going to participate in a citizen's assembly in France again for this exact reason, because they've put time, effort, money, everything into it, and then actually it's ended in a bit of a, a, bit of a slow burn and puff of smoke. Um, so I think those are your three things really that you need to need to employ if you want it to be successful. Wonderful. And then I'd like to, could I just quickly respond to one other question? Sure, um, yes, we only have five minutes left, so. Sorry, I'll keep it, it super short. It so was much. a massive question, so it could be a two-sentence answer. <laughs> yes. um, the one about how, you know, democracy can save the environment in developing democracies or places where you're having trouble with your government. Uh, it is a huge question, and if the answer was simple, then obviously everybody will be doing it. Um, but I think the, the answer is, is searching for, the, there's different ways of holding your government accountable. Activism is one of them, employing international bodies to, to get involved, but also seeking out those politicians and those policymakers that are actually willing to do the work. I know it's not a real, it's not a solution, but it's a, it's a beginning to an answer, I think. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. So over to Sushant for brief comments. Yes, brief is uh, uh, the operative word. Um, like amazing, amazing observations from the, the youth uh, participants. 
Um, I, what strikes me is that we have a very limited window to pick our interventions. We have 10 years, right? So when we think about sustainable development pathways, we have to think what will materialize actionable results that get us to the to the thresholds we need to within 10 years. For me, and, and respectfully to Tomer, I don't believe cities and the pathway to sustainable development will happen within 10 years with cities. It will happen within 30 years with cities because all migration trends point to cities in the epicenter of, of you know, urban populations uh, of the future. I think we need referendums. We need climate referendums at the national level in every major democracy over the next five years to decide whether we're going to prioritize industrial policy or whether we're going to decide uh, and prioritize environmental policy in order to preserve uh, the planet. Uh, to Diana's point, and hopefully to Elena's point, this issue of, uh, of uh, binding power and corruption, you know, what do you do when the gatekeepers don't want you to participate or they don't do anything with your, with your uh, ideas? I, I think you still have, ideas still have very strong normative power. They, they can push people to adopt certain things if there's enough political will around them. Uh, not in the same way of petitions, but in the same way that they provide uh, creative solutions uh, that are not on the agenda. I think it's our, our imperative to come up with those ideas and push for them uh, from the bottom up and using the tools that we have, whether it's platforms like ours, other crowdsourcing platforms, show that there all are alternatives that are not being considered that are feasible and are practical um yeah uh, if we had more time i'd tell you about some of the challenges we'd face we have faced uh with this buying solution thing we, we, we implement uh our model inside companies some bottom-up process and face it as well uh but i i know that there are a couple of solutions but Maybe people can follow up offline, and I'm happy to share my, my uh, observations there. Thanks very much. Don't quit, you guys. This is our <laughs> world, and uh, we need people like you, uh, like all of us, to continue pushing forward. So don't be dis discouraged. Thank you so much, Sushant. Um, I, I hope the, the Council of Europe co-organizers don't mind if we go over for a few minutes so that we can have... Also, last comments from Tumor and, and Gavin, which I think are would be uh, very warmly welcomed from everyone. So, uh, Tumor, it's over to you. Well, one question I got was, how can we how can we help put Climate View in the hands of youth movements, etc.? And I'd say, yeah, uh, that's a, we very much want to do that, and we're looking at ways to do that, to, yeah, basically put it in the hand of youth movement. We are doing some local experiments with just that. Um, and, um, yeah, so, yes, it's a good idea, and yes, we want to go there. And actually, I think it's, in the, it's actually the only way to make it happen fast enough to in, get the civil, civil movements involved, because it puts pressure from both directions, and that's what we need. Thanks for the question. Excellent. Thank you. And over to you, Gavin. Great, I'll try to be concise. So um, I'd love to talk in more detail, but I think electric cars work much better than is commonly known. So um, I have been really surprised. We spend a lot of time talking with auto manufacturers. They are very, very serious about going to zero emissions. And I think in a world where everything is complicated and all this is hard, um, betting big on electric cars is one thing that actually probably really is going to work, to my surprise. Um, the other thing I would say is that, so, so climate trace data is going to be uh, free and transparent, open source, available to everybody on uh, September 16. Um, our theory is that um, what corporations and unaccountable governments really respond to is scandals that are very, very specific about what you want to do about it. So we have this theory that um, really targeting on a specific emitting asset, like this fire, has burned down these carbon offsets that where people are getting paid for, you know, this kind of scandal-based thinking. That's the kind of thing where youth activists um, are generally more effective than I think people realize. Uh, and it is actually, you can really get corporations and, and even governments that are not democratic responding if you can make it really, really specific. Here's the emissions we're talking about. And here's what you're saying we should do about it. Because my biggest discovery has been that when people don't act, 
often um, the reason is that it's kind of messy and complicated and they kind of move on to the next issue. And if you can make it so they have no wiggle room, it's really, really clear what you're saying. Um, often uh, it has been more effective in my experience. I don't know if that's helpful. Brilliant, really, really helpful thinking about different pressure points uh, to, to engage and, and get movement and, and action on the, on the pro policy front. Um, just if I may mention very briefly to Diana also um, about addressing national corruption, maybe entrenched corruption often where there's, there's capture of judicial branch, et cetera. There's a new proposal that I just like to mention to you for an, an international anti-corruption court. Uh, it's, it's being advocated for by Integrity Initiatives International, and you can find their website easily. Um, and they have a whole youth network around the world of, of youth working on this project. Uh, and the objective is really to have another layer of, of, of oversight and assistance to countries to tackle entrenched uh, corruption. As Amy was saying, one of the levers is to, to get international bodies to help at the national level. And the, uh, the advocates for this court have, have talked about really how these issues of systemic corruption have, have been impeding uh, uh, climate action, where we need like laser focus of our leaders on these, these huge challenges that are, that are before us. So with that, uh, because we're out of time, we could uh, indeed continue debating and, and talking and, and digging into these issues for much, much longer. And so I do hope that our conversations will continue in various different venues and, and, and we can really continue on this really important in intersection uh, of issues in trying to grapple with this climate and ecological challenge that we're, we are now all confronting. So. Uh, a really warm thanks to all of our really excellent uh, speakers and presenters. Uh, it's just been wonderful to to learn from from your knowledge and very also on the ground and, and very practical, helpful knowledge as we think about the future. And then also to our youth delegates. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And as Sushian says, don't give up, <laughs> please. We need you and we need to also work work together across across the generations. So thank you everybody for, for really a great event, a great forum talk, and we all hope to see you again at uh, further World uh, Democracy Forum uh, events and, and uh, hosted by the Council of, of Europe and, and other partners. So thank you everybody and uh, good evening uh, to all. <laughs> thank you.